vigilant day and night. for coming back for another episode of Comics and Cosmetics. I'm your host, Danny Sansasi, licensed cosmetologist and registered super nerd. And today I'm very excited because we have the designer and artist from some of my favorite and probably your favorite nerdy things ever. Nerdlings of all shapes and sizes, I give you Mr. Neville Page. Hello. <laughs> Hello. You did Wharf. That's all I care about right now. <laughs> How well, are you? I'm good. I'm really good. Thank you. Oh, Thanks good. for having me on. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for putting up with me, first of all, and agreeing to do this. Like, this is super exciting for me. I'm a massive, massive nerd uh, in, in the traditional sense, but also in the makeup sense. And, you know, as we were talking backstage, mm -hmm. I like knowing how the chicken nuggets are made. Yeah. I, yeah. I like. Until you find out how they're made. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> disgusting. We don't want to talk about that. But, um, I like watching the pieces come together to make the whole. I talked to Dave Blass. Uh, he's actually the one who told me, oh, you should talk to Neville. And I'm like, should I? You should. I, can I? Um, and he's been he's been great on Twitter with um, sharing all the the behind the scenes, the designs, the little Easter eggs and stuff. And you have as well one of my favorite things that you posted to your story were the attack tribbles. Oh, yeah, that was I guess my most recent post. I don't post too often mm -mm. and i i posted that recently and i did not realize the kind of feedback i was going to get but you know you're always going to get some feedback but it was just kind of like uh uh i did <laughs> i didn't see what other people saw <laughs> you know, sincerely i mean i i really did not i didn't either until you just said that and i was like what could people see oh yeah yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, nature, nature repeats itself. And yes, I've, there, there have been jobs where the job was to go there. Uh, for example, working on a, a, the alien franchise, which Ooh. Mr. Gear was the one at the helm of those aesthetics. And we know that he did certain things that were provocative in uh, aesthetic and content so you you're obligated to to do that but with the um <clears throat> the tribbles it was just purely an exercise in probable potential biological I mean, it makes realism sense. yeah yeah it makes sense and and it wasn't until it was pointed out to me i thought oh i didn't i didn't see it and i still don't i get it i get the perception of it and it doesn't matter because you know nature's nature right but, but um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I, I thought I have wanted to do the triple anatomy for years. Oh, yeah. Just because it's such a, it, well, it's not been touched. And it just felt like well, when something's not been touched and we don't know what it is, it's just kind of free license to do whatever. 
-hmm. So it was a real delight to be able to do that. What, um, what did you research? Like what inspired that attack triple anatomy for you? The, nothing specifically uh, to begin with, because it could be anything as mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, but, but obviously when you look at it, there, there are references. Um, if you know anything about snail mouths and um, urchins and things like that, th those sort of, became the reference point, but I didn't go into it thinking, let me do a snail mouth. Right. However, the one thing I did want it to be, well, one is to answer the question of, hey, Neville, can you design a Tribble that's terrifying? It's kind of our uh, our moment when it hits the glass and it's, yes. it's frightening and it's, it's slithery. And so the, there were descriptions there that made you go, okay, it's got mucus, it's got teeth. It shouldn't be like a dog's mouth because that would make no sense. It's got to fit inside of a tribble. So from that, I, I've done a lot of um, studying over the years, like real dedicated studying as opposed to just going on Google and looking up an image. Mm -hmm. I would study snails. I would buy a snail. I would look at a snail. I have microscopes to look at animals under the microscope. I never harm the animals, honestly, because I'm opposed to it. Um, for research, especially for my own edification, wouldn't be cool. But I, I really put a an earnest effort into understanding what it is that uh, happens in nature. And whether I use it or not immediately is irrelevant. I just am curious. But you amass a, a mental library of reference and biology and science so that when you're given a task, which is kind of nice, rather than having to go to research, Mm -hmm. You can mentally tap into, oh, you know, a snail has this amazing radula teeth, basically, inside of it that that kind of poke itself out to chew and to scrape. And then I think of other animals. And so all of it's in your head, and it allows you to sort of assemble a direction that you would take. And then if the references are a little bit vague in your mind, then you can go online and get some specific things. So I, I wouldn't start from scratch in that particular arena because it was a very fast project. So a lot of it was photo bashing, taking either photographs that I've found or taken myself and then just combine them in a biological way that looks compelling and, and viable, but also is satisfying the cool factor. Yeah. The frightening factor. Yeah. They, they were simple in that regard because it's just pure, um, sculpture and, and shape and design. And it, it, it didn't have to necessarily work, but it had to make, uh, it would give the impression that it could function. And people pointed out that there was a lot of similarities between that and the, the giant face hugger from Prometheus. And there are, it wasn't my intention. It's just kind of the parameters of being able to grapple, consume, digest, horrify. Yeah added up to similar, similar attributes. Well, and you have your own style too. I, I, I would imagine. I mean, of course, a I, little bit of your signature is going to come through. It, it is. And you know, what's interesting about that. Hmm. I try not to, I don't succeed often because there's two things about that with personal style. Mm-hmm. I'm hired to do, to realize somebody else's vision, right? My style, my personal, anything should have nothing to do with their needs. So when I hear someone say, I saw a creature in a film and I knew that you designed it, I almost kind of feel like I failed a little bit because it shouldn't be recognizable. But the reality is you can't help, but be yourself and, and tap into the resources that you have. And not that I want to defend myself, but to, to kind of defend those of us who do this, th there's a speed at which you have to get things done. Mm -hmm. So if you're given, let's say a day, and that's not unreasonable. Sometimes you're given a day to do it. The right. final thing that's going to end up on screen. If you're given that short amount of time, you only have the time and the resources to reference, to execute something the the gestation period 
of allowing something to percolate and evolve in your mind for a while. Yes. Is very, very short. Yes. So there are times, and I have gone into some assignments where it's like, what you've just asked me to do means I'm going to have to give you what I know I can do and reference. It's going to be, sorry, we just blacked out for a second. That's it's going okay. to be, um, it's going to be the same shapes and same language that I've done because that's the one I can go to the quickest in, in the spirit of avatar, for example, where Jim gave us months, months to develop something. It means you can try, explore, make mistakes, try again, explore, make mistakes and really push the envelope. But if you only have a certain amount of time, it's kind of like, uh, you're going to get, what I know you're going to, I'm going to pull out the library and the tools that I've been using for ages. The, um, the creative flow, it, it's, if you restrict it, give it any parameters at, at all, it can affect that. Mm -hmm. and that's something I I've noticed with myself. I mean, I've never been anybody else, so I can't say, but uh, whenever I was ghostwriting or, you know, writing anything for anybody else, it was so much harder. It was so much harder. Mm -hmm. And then you put the time limit on it too. And that just makes it even worse. I eventually just stepped away from that because it's like, that's not for me. I'm way too rebellious for that nonsense. I can't. I just well, can't. You know, true creativity mm -hmm. and true invention demands time. So when a client, a boss, whomever uh, asks that of you, but doesn't afford you the resources of time and money to do it, then it's an unfair ask. Right. And that's often the case. So that's why it's such a competitive uh, and, you know, dare I say, sometimes stressful artistic situation to be in because it's so tight time-wise. But the expectation is... I demand great from you, <laughs> quote unquote, something I've never seen before. And it's like, well, that takes time. It just takes right. time. And think of it in terms of you're, you're going to cook a meal at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got 15 minutes to make a meal. What do we have available now? I can do a quick spaghetti sauce because I know the basics of that. But your kids are screaming, I want something inventive, something I've never eaten before. It's like, well, it's going to take me a moment to conceive, try, and <laughs> test out a few recipes. So right. next week you'll get, you know, couscous and something <laughs> else. So it, I think that oftentimes the the responsibility is on the uh, the person hiring you, if they're asking for something truly creative to give you the right, to give the artist the right amount of time to get, and I'm going to say it, to give the artist the respect of time and money to be able to do not just what they've been asked to do, but what they, they are supposed to do and desire to do. And, and oftentimes you're shackled with various parameters and held accountable <laughs> for not being able to produce something you've never seen before. And sometimes the director or producer showrunner doesn't exactly know how to articulate what they're looking for. And that can be a struggle too. Um, but in yeah, regards to a, your work on this last season of Picard, I have a very strong suspicion that was not the case with Terry. I, I feel like Terry knew exactly what he wanted and how to, express that to you guys yes but as a human mm -hmm. uh, and this is this is a compliment to terry there are things that you know you want that you can't articulate because that's not his job um you know we as visual artists and say my role in particular specifically in a moment on picard would be creature design i, I've done, I do a variety of things on the show mm -hmm but let's just say specifically creature. Well, that's not his, not been his focus for years and years and years. So what, although I, I agree with you a lot in regard to it's up to the client to articulate those needs. Mm -hmm. 
at the same time, we as artists can't have the arrogance and expectation of someone who doesn't do this, doesn't ingest it all day long, um, to expect them to be able to articulate what they're looking for. So we have to respect that um, language barrier, if you will. And then our job becomes, how do I help them articulate to me what it is they're looking for? So it, it's it's another skill that you're not necessarily trained to do in school or in life, but how do you become a good listener? And how do you, when you know the person's struggling to try and explain something they have not yet seen, how can I then help you tell me what to do? Right. Uh, and that's, you know, that comes with experience and, and maturity. And um, again, being just not being arrogant about well, and, what and asking, you may know. Sorry? Asking the right questions. That's, um, right questions are such an important thing. When uh, I was teaching, I would tell my apprentice or my student, you know, don't come in and ask them, what do you want? They have mm -hmm. no idea what they want. Most women who come in on a whim, even men who come in on a whim, uh, will say, well, you know, uh, something different, you know, yes. just uh, make mm -hmm. me look good. Men will invariably say shorter on the sides, longer on top. Mm -hmm. Well, no kidding. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> no kidding. Ask like with a woman, ask how many kids do you have? Do you work? What do you do for a living? Find out what their time is, how much time they have. Find out if they're high maintenance, low maintenance, somewhere in between. That will dictate what kind of hair they want. Ask them what everything else in their life is like, except for their hair, like, except for that. So when you're talking to Terry and he says, all right, we've got Worf. It's my favorite. We have Worf and he's older. He's been meditating. Um, he's become a connoisseur of chamomile teas. <laughs> so uh, what kind of questions would you, were you asking Terry when it came to developing his, you know, older, more advanced, handsome Klingon look? Well, Worf is a unique scenario mm -hmm. um, because a it's Worf. Yeah, he's a Klingon. Oh, what he looks like. <laughs> yeah, we know what he looks like. We mm -hmm. know we can all. First, let me step back and say a. I was a fan of Next Generation uh, first, before I was designing. Um, I was an industrial designer doing medical products and children's toys when I was watching Next Generation. So that's where I came from. So stepping into the privileged opportunity to design on the show, um, I wasn't thinking, how can I put my signature on this? Mm -hmm. Now, we tried some things, we collectively on the Klingons in Discovery, mm -hmm. and uh, some things worked and some things did not. But the most important thing, which I, I don't think I would have had to have had the Klingon Discovery experience to know this, but the most important thing about Worf was to have it be Worf. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the, Vincent Van Dyke, who his company did the... Uh, the prosthetics, the the master sculpture, and, and all the processing of the silicone, et cetera, hair work. Um, Vincent and I have worked closely for quite some time. So our, our relationship and our dynamic um, is right on point. It, it's, it's so good professionally and, and personally, but mm -hmm. professionally, we both fortunately are in alignment. So when it came to doing a new Klingon, because there was two Klingons that we were going to be doing, sort of background Klingons and Worf. So the background ones were the ones I was focused on initially because we knew Worf was going to be Worf. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, let's play with these background ones. And the goal at that point was do not change the Klingons. Honor the Klingons. Do what they are supposed to be, the expectation. And we all knew what that was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, then creatively for me, that doesn't leave a whole lot of uh, room to do something different. 
And that was not offensive to me. It was like, perfect. <laughs> because <laughs> I don't need to put my spin on it. I really didn't. It, and this is kind of interesting because I've gotten a lot of queries about, you know, and fortunately from a very positive point of view, we love Wharf and how we turned oh, out. Yeah. What, how did you do that, Neville? It's like, I, I'll tell you exactly how I did it. I didn't do much. <laughs> it's possibly why it's so successful. So it was really about making sure, A, and it starts with the person who owns Wharf, and that is Mr. Dorn. That's his guy. That's his character. So even though Terry has his list of desires, and the, and the narrative, the script, the story demands a certain um, shift in Wharf's look, which some people love and some people don't. Hair's too gray. Okay. You'll never win. But, no. um, and that's okay. But I'm not even trying to win. The, the most important thing was making sure that Michael Dorn was satisfied with what we were doing for him. So because of that, um, I focused on every single perfect moment, in my opinion, from the show with his makeup. And it, it, it changed from episode one to it, talking about the uh, next generation. There, there was a hairstyle that was a specific shape that created a iconography. Seasons, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so you, you track that and you personally um, point to those things where it's like, ah, I didn't really care for that as much as I like this. That's perfect. That's not as perfect. So you take all the good stuff, you reference the stuff that you didn't like as much, and you then tune that in. So at the end of the day, really all that Worf needed to be was a refined sculpture. And that wasn't me. Um, that was Vincent Van Dyke's studio. And newer materials and technologies uh, that afford a more realistic look. Mm -hmm. So realism in terms of the material that's glued to your face, but also in terms of performance, how the, the rubber um, complies to your gesticulation. And again, that was all Vincent Van Dyke and team. The hair, how well the hair is done, uh, the hair, the, the punching of the eyebrows, yeah. Um, it was his beard, I think, for the most part. There might have been some augmentation. So it's one of those things where when I'm complimented, I appreciate it, but I want to I want to make sure that that compliment is is given to the right people, which is really Vincent Van Dyke, his team, and James McKinnon and, and his team with application because you know all the greatest rubber in the world is is irrelevant if you can't apply it yeah, definitely sure. like they did. And, and again, Michael Dorn was the one who needed to approve it. I don't think technically that had to happen. I'm not sure of the uh, parameters there, the protocol. But personally, I felt like if Michael's good with it, then we're good with it. And if Michael's good with it and the audience isn't good with it, they need to become good with it because it's Michael's call. It's right. his character. And I think um, as a big Trekker, a <laughs> huge Star Trek fan. Uh, I think I could say that if Michael is okay with it, we're going to be okay with it. Because yeah. Yeah. He's, he's our wharf. He's wharf. He's wharf. No one's going to protect it more than the actor that has lived it for years. So yeah. th that made it the scariest yeah. makeup of all <laughs> because of that. It's like it, it, we want to bring fresh new something, but it doesn't need to be different. Um, the, the really where I contributed was more with Terry in that we were trying to come up with like an overall palette. Okay. How salt and pepper, how gray, how long, how, what kind of braid, are there any details woven into his braids? Those kind of things were ex experiments and explorations. I have a weird question. Maybe it's not a weird question, but um, he had like last we saw him, he had these beautiful waves. Was there a discussion mm -hmm about getting rid of his wavy hair and then just going to the straight white? There were many, and I didn't, I wasn't part of them, really. Um, I I don't have a great answer. I'm so sorry. I, I wish I had like, well, <laughs> well, I mean, right. of course, this is an amazing backstory. 
<laughs> I got nothing. Um, other than I think they just wanted a tighter, a tighter groom on him. A little bit more of a, you know, there's conversation about spirituality and mm -hmm. you know, the Klingons are a fascinating oh yes alien culture yeah. uh, to begin with. And I've I've done bald Klingons a whole lot uh, yeah. to the chagrin of many. And I've always wanted to do something with hair that isn't, you know, 80s, 90s rock. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just like, what can we do with the hair, but still have there be hair? Mm -hmm. And when they were talking about doing uh, braids, possible dreads, um, we, we even referenced, ironically, Whoopi Goldberg's, um, the Whoopi Goldberg hair. Yeah. Not the Whippy Goldberg from Picard, right. because she's got such great dreads. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, maybe that's a way to go. So we we explored all of it, and some of it was simply I did imagery, sent it off to Terry. Terry then shared it with the appropriate parties, probably um, Sir Patrick Stewart and then Michael Dorn, and they had opinions, and it just came back to me as like A and B. But the the, the Success of that is really Vincent and uh, James, quite frankly. Now, you did um, the J.J. Abrams track, the Klingons for J.J. Abrams, which was mm -hmm. the, what Discovery was based off of initially. I, am, I, am I wrong? Like Technically, you're wrong. Uh, okay. No offense. No, it's the, okay. The, the only relationship between Discovery and JJ's was I was working on them, mm -hmm. but they were they were different. Now the bald okay. thing was not my choice. Uh, on on JJ's, God, did I even propose that? I can't remember whose idea it was. But let's be arrogant and assume it was me. <laughs> um, meaning I'll take the I'll take the blame. <clears throat> when we set out to do the Klingons with JJ. I thought it would be cool to do hairless because we hadn't seen a whole lot of what the ridgy stuff could be. What happens past here? Right. It's been done, but um, I thought maybe we can evolve that. So in JJ's first one, the Klingons were all wore helmets. So you never saw it. So what I was designing was underneath the helmet, some hair. <laughs> and I was like, okay. That's going to be an easy makeup to do by comparison. Right. So then when we got to Into Darkness, we discussed San's hair and thought, okay, let's explore that. And there was a lot of interesting exploration. I'm still proud of that work. It was pretty cool looking ideas. I thought it was very cool. And oh, what, you. what you have going for you when it comes to changing Klingons is – um. Deep Space Nine episode, Trials and Tribulations. That's the first mm -hmm. time it's mentioned. They're sitting there, and Worf's got a hat on, you know, they're back in time on the original, on the old Enterprise, with, on Kirk's Enterprise. And all the original Klingons are in this bar. And they're looking around like, where are all the Klingons? And Worf's like, there's some over there. And there's some over there. And Bashir and O'Brien are like, where? What are you talking about? And he's like, those are Klingons. And they look back at Worf and they say, well, what happened? And he said, mm -hmm. we, we don't do talk about that. <laughs> and then that's always been my excuse when somebody asks me, I don't discuss it. Don't discuss it. <laughs> but then you have Enterprise try to discuss it because it was, you know, the Klingons were trying to super soldier themselves. Yeah. Thanks to, you know, the eugenics stuff with, with Khan and everything. So what you have going for you is that the Klingons have evolved several times in the past. Mm -hmm. So, all you have to do is say, well, they're still evolving from that that virus. So now they just look even more badass than this one. That's why. <laughs> well, you know. You have two kinds of fans, ones that go for that and ones that don't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're you're working with an alternative timeline, too, the, the mm -hmm. Kelvin timeline, which is not appealing to some. It, my My approach was quite simple. And it was more artistic. Wouldn't it be cool to see what the shape of their head is? And and how can we capitalize on a bald right. Klingon? And should we then reverse engineer the potential success of the aesthetic into a narrative? And that is 
their military and they shave their heads kind of thing. And there's, there's all sorts of justifications. You know, I, I think it's very important that you don't justify post justify right. in response to negative response. Um, you should have a vision going into it. And it was a, it was a clear vision. And for the most part, I think they were a successful variation. Um, I, I liked where they went and, and so when we got to discovery, because of the responses that I'd personally heard about, oh, bald Klingons, we don't want to see bald Klingons. Bald Klingons never existed. It's like, mm, they Christopher did. Christopher Plummer. I know. <laughs> um, which is really cool that his daughter ended up in Star Trek. But when we were doing Discovery, Brian Fuller had mentioned a, a variety of things that were uh, of interest to him with respects to Klingons. And some of them were like crazy out there, which I love. And other stuff was as simple as maybe we have their eyes a little wider apart and they're bald and some have albinism for the purposes of the, the narrative. And so there's like, oh, and, and the most important thing that Brian Fuller told me and, and introduced to the concept of the Klingons was that uh, I'm, I'm going to destroy my apologies, Brian, if you ever hear this. I'm paraphrasing, but he wanted them to be self-aware, artistically, mm -hmm. culturally, and he wanted the vibe of particularly the, the male environment to feel like that of a gentleman's club, not a strip club, gentleman's club, but like a gentleman's club, smoking room right. kind of thing. And I thought, ooh, that's pretty cool. And he brought up the notion of, I think Art Nouveau was thrown out there as an idea. Um, Islam in terms of textiles. There's just a lot of different stuff. Yeah. And I ran with all of that. And that's where I, I kind of introduced the idea of using for the torchbearer in particular, ancient alien concepts for the, the, not the shape of them. I would say George Sakakalis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing is that you, you, these motifs mm -hmm. should not apply to the biology of the Klingons. Mm -hmm. But we we apply we started applying it and you know it just it drifted and changed and turned into what it is. But I I love and I will forever defend the culture stuff that we're introducing oh, because I, thought, I don't think there's any disputing that the Klingons could have potentially a version of their culture which is highbrow high art sophisticated non warring. Well, that's very, it has happened. Again, I'll reference Christopher Plummer. Mm -hmm. his, I mean, he was hybrid. He was quoting Shakespeare and his wife was so elegant and she yep. always wore the jewelry and the finery. It just, that spoke highbrow to me. Absolutely. I thought what you guys did culture wise was phenomenal because the Klingons do have such a rich, history and cult fictional as it is but they've really put a lot of of work into that and to be able to have that brought out and see it it just adds to it i thought that was nicely done well thank you and that's to everyone's credit a lot of minds involved mm -hmm. but you know the hardest thing is when star trek first happened in the 60s mm -hmm. There's no way I think that Roddenberry, et cetera, said, you know what, this is going to, this is going to be so successful. It's going to last for years and yeah. years and years and years and years and be so expensive. So what happens is icons are built. So let's go with Vulcans for a second as a reference. So you got Spock mm -hmm. and he's got a particular hairstyle and makeup and ears, which were not the same episode one as they were a few episodes later. Mm -hmm. And so that then became the look of a Vulcan. And then there were other Vulcans introduced. So what did they look like? Well, we got to have the pointy ears, similar makeup and eyebrows and hairstyle. Cut to years and years later, we're going to have Vulcans. Well, what do they look like? Well, they're going to have the same hairstyle. And I believe you know hairstyles change. <laughs> so, but that is what makes 
a Vulcan a Vulcan in the zeitgeist of the audience. So if you, and we did this as an experiment just on, on paper where I would, I was doing Vulcans and that's let's explore hairstyles that are not this mm -hmm. and longer hair, which means you've covered the ears. So the only thing you had was a little bit of a peek to the eyebrow, but the hairstyle just completely changed it, took it out of being Vulcan. But at the same time, I felt like, yeah, but that's life. That's kind of what you have to do to, unless the Vulcan genetic is coupled to hairstyling somehow, <laughs> and it never changes. So, you know, you look at choices of costume and choices of hairstyling. They're iconic because that's what we know them to be. And it really creates a tough challenge when you you do something that is normal from a human point of view and it changes the look. It's kind of like Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. Let's say he dyed his hair black and he didn't wear glasses. Well, that's not Andy Warhol to right. us. There's only one version of Andy Warhol that we know. And that goes with a lot of people who choose to create, fabricate, and sustain an identity. You know, you are known for that. And I think that that's valuable, I guess, if you're trying to create an identity, um, but dangerous because it means you're kind of a one note right. thing. Yeah. So it's, it's tricky. And I, I, I understand it, mm -hmm. uh, but I often uh, struggle from an artistic point of view. It's like, well, they're not going to all have the same hairstyle. It's like the Bajorans, you know, they got that specific yeah. thing, which I was so ready to do a, a Bajoran earring. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, what, do they all wear that same earring? Would it be the same? And then you can kind of reference, I mean, just take a look at um, uh, our new king and queen of England. They went through a process that's so old and so traditional, all the accoutrements were used in the process, the staff, the this, the that, it's iconic. It has not changed. So you can, you can reference certain things and say, eh, even though it's been hundreds of years, we're still doing it today in a, um, a, a first world country. So it's, it's, it's plausible. Mm -hmm. but again, it's a balance. And at the end of the day, all that matters is we entertain audiences and they, enjoy what they're experiencing or we challenge them in such a way that they embrace a potential change. Well, what I, I I've spoken to Todd and Dave, um, still working. Todd Chernowski, I'm right? assuming. Huh? Todd Chernowski. Uh, Todd Stashwick. Oh, excuse me. I was thinking of the uh, production designer, Todd Chernowski, who was also on Picard and Discovery. No, I haven't got to talk to him. Um, Good guy. We work together a lot. I'll have to reach out to him as well. But I talked to Todd Stashwick and Dave. Um, like I said, I'm still working on Terry. Mm -hmm. um, but I told both of them that coming from a lifelong fan, you know, um, I was a kid when Next Generation came out. But that was something I did with my little brother and my dad every week without fail. We were mm. massive dorks about it. We had the blueprints for the Enterprise. We poured over them looking for bathrooms. We found one. It was in Riker's quarters. Um, don't know why. Well, you know what? I know why he's the only one with a bathroom. He needs to shower with all his uh, running around. He does. But um, it, this was something that was very close to close to my heart. And my, my brother passed 10 years ago. And uh, when the first episode of season three came out, The Next Generation, there were times, I swear, I lost my breath. And, you know, I would just, tears, you know, would, would well up because you guys found that magic blend of nostalgia and new. You found that, that line, that perfect line where you gave us just enough fan service but kept that story driving forward. Mm -hmm. 
very rare is it that you see something like that because the next generation and is almost its own franchise in and of itself but to yeah. see something like that tied up with such a neat little bow where you you have such a satisfying end mm-hmm. to that where you're okay that you may not see this group together again and that's mm-hmm. fine because you got the ending you wanted the look of it was so well done you really feel like it is that world just a few years in the future. And it's probably ticked off a lot of the other fran- fran- that words are hard. It's probably ticked off a lot of the other franchises because your team, Dave's team, t- you guys showed them all that it can be done. Like we can bring back this, this beloved, beloved nerdy thing and do it well and make these people so happy. Like I, I can't think of any other time that that has actually been pulled off. Like <laughs> you guys did it and you can tell the love and passion that each of you have for this franchise. And you can tell that you like Star Trek. You can tell. That that is probably the greatest compliment any of us who worked on it could hear is that you could tell that we liked and were fans of it. I don't know anyone on the production, I don't know everyone, but that wasn't a fan and committed uh, to the point of you know, Dave, he knew and knows way more about Star Trek than most of us on the show. He has He's, he's, he's embarrassingly knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> and and I remember being in one of the many production meetings with him and listening to him talk production design with everyone else. I'm like, this guy knows some stuff, man. I'm going to lean on him because I'm a fan, but a light fan. I didn't do the research, meaning when I was watching the show, as a, as a fan, I wasn't reading up. I was just enjoying the moments, moving on with my life, coming back next Thursday evening, watching the next episode, loving it. And I, I know you didn't ask this question, so I apologize that I'm going to answer my own question in my head. Go for it. Which discovery was, a uh, season was starting to wrap. Mm-hmm. And there was conversation about Picard possibly starting. I thought, mm-hmm. Picard? There's going to be a show called Picard with like Picard. And I love Discovery and I love the experience. Um, but for whatever reason, no, not whatever reason, I know the exact reason. When I heard that Picard was going to happen, I thought I've got to, I hope that I can be a part of that. Mostly because of Patrick Stewart yes. and my love for him as a, as a human being. I, I, I don't know him. Um, I've been in a room with him. We've shaken hands and that's all wonderful. But everything I've heard about him, he's also uh, from the same area that I'm from in uh, England. Really? I was born born in in the Lake District area, Manchester, but families in the Lake District. You both just totally dumped that Manchester accent, I see. (laughs) Oh, I still got one. It's it's, as thick as can be. No, it's gone. (laughs) But he, he was aspirational. And he still is as a human being. So I wanted that opportunity for that. But for whatever reason, I just felt like there was a class, classiness about yes. him and the crew. Yes. As characters and as people. And it was that combination that just, I, I really, really, really wanted to be a part of it. And I was fortunate that I could be. And one of the most wonderful byproducts that came from that, I didn't seek it out. Um, and this is kind of a, a long description of many different things. Mm-hmm. When you're an artist working on makeups in particular, mm-hmm. the most important thing to do is understand the client. And there's mm-hmm. a few clients here. There's the audience. Uh, and there's the guy or girl who's hired you. Then there's the person who's going to be wearing it. Now, whether it's Michael Dorn because he he embodies it and that's his character, or it's a brand new actor who's going to own it and embody it. 
um, even if it's just for an episode. Your job is to understand their needs, whether it be just technical needs. I'm uncomfortable with wearing too much of this, or I'm not good with contact lenses. You understand all those needs, and then you design accordingly. So rather than just design a thing, um, I do my best to be put in touch with the performer, um, actually in touch, get their cell phone number, which is, you know, imagine asking that. It's like, never we need you to design such and such. Give me the phone number. <laughs> then I'll design. <laughs> I'm going to need Sir Patrick Stewart's phone number. Yeah. For yeah, reason. And unfortunately, he didn't wear any makeup, so I had no reason to get his phone number. But um, I made it a point to be there with Vincent Van Dyke at his studio and the actor to introduce myself, ask them questions. Um, and th that's just the most critical thing because you, you get to really know them and you get to hear firsthand, not filtered through a variety of other people, what it is they want. And they can send you private messages saying, Hey, the, we did the test. I thought this was great. Can this be adjusted? Um, and that relationship is vital to the success of a production. The byproduct of that has the potential, again, didn't seek it out, that you might just uh, become friendly with some of the performers. And, you know, you are a family for a short period of time. TV shows are different. It's a long period of time. And I ended up becoming friendly with people that were just heroes. Um, Riker was just Riker to me. He wasn't a human being uh, until he was a human being. And all of a sudden it's like, God, what, a, what an amazing guy. I had the it, biggest crush on Riker. <laughs> when I, was I don't blame you. I think I did too. <laughs> Why not? He's, he's, he's aspirational. Stance. But you know, Jerry Ryan getting to work with her. Um, it, it's it's just one of those things that what a what a privileged opportunity to be in their presence to begin with. But when you're a fan of it, and you're you're in the same room as Data, you know, what do I do? What do I say? But where I'm going with this is, and then you meet them as human beings. Um, and that's like the true test of what you're dealing with, because you know, there's a lot of people in the world who they're your heroes for whatever reason, right or wrong. And then you meet your hero and it's like, hmm, oh, well, <laughs> a bit of a bummer. <laughs> the, the fantasy and hope of these characters and actors becoming, um, sustaining that hero status was, uh, profound to me because I saw an opportunity with a make a wish um, scenario for a young girl who had cancer and her dream was to uh, come to Hollywood and see how makeup is done oh. and to experience all of that. And I thought, okay, well, Obviously, any Make-A-Wish Foundation thing, you you one must put the effort in. Right. So I thought, okay, let me check in with some of the cast and see if they would be willing to meet with her and say hello and get her to see this side of life. And every one of them was uh, above and beyond helpful and, and gracious with their time and energy. And she got to live this last experience of her life to the fullest. So Wonderful. it's, it's one of those things where it's a, it's a rare opportunity that you get to forge these relationships and, and I'm going to say utilize them in a way, way outside the scope of entertainment and see that these people are human beings and they're interested in the value of other people. So I, I'm, I'm doing nothing here with just throwing crazy praise at our cast but it, it's it's nice to be able to humanize these these icons uh, of the the ip and uh, of entertainment and you know they they are such incredible people and that's 
to me, my greatest takeaway from all of this is the relationships that you, you develop outside of the creative side of um, what we do. I can, I, I can 100% agree with you on that. Um, just in my experience from, from doing this, um, mm -hmm. I know we've talked about Brian before, uh, and he told me to tell you, hello. I um, love Brian. He, he took good care of me. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. he one of the Star Treks. Yeah. He, yeah. uh, he and I have become very good friends and, uh, as I've talked about on my show before, we are working on a project to make more comfortable and um, more cosmetic prosthetics. I have been an amputee since 94. I was born disabled, but I've been an amputee since 94. And the older I got, the more difficult it got, you know, doing hair for 20 years, being on my feet, raising four kids, you know, it took its toll. And uh, we've been working on that. We're kind of in the angel investor Great. period right now, uh, you know, seeking whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but none of that would be happening if I hadn't reached out to him and developed that relationship and so on and so forth. It's It's been a beautiful experience and I've got a really good friend out of it. Um, and it was nice hearing, you know, you kind of fanboyed a little bit about Brent Spiner, about data. Mm -hmm. I, I was telling Brian, like, you know, I would pee my pants if I was told I got to even look at a Star Trek set. Like I went, I got to t sit in Picard's chair, you know, it was touring around the country. I got to do uh -huh. that. It was so exciting. But Did you pee on the chair as a result? No, I held right. it. I wore okay, good. a diaper. <laughs> you you learn after a while that you just you always have an adult diaper nearby. Hey, I'm a 42 year old mother of four. There's always an adult diaper. <laughs> I don't cough a lot. <laughs> but um, I understand. I asked him because you know he worked on Star Trek movies with you. Mm -hmm. I said. Did you ever have a fanboy moment? And, you know, Brian's always very professional about it. But he goes, there was this one time I had just taken a break and I'm sitting in a makeup chair and I'm just kind of looking through my phone or whatever. And then I feel someone brush behind me and then sit down in the chair next to me and I look over and it's Leonard Nimoy waiting to get his ears put on. And mm -hmm. he said, I dropped my phone and he said, oh, how are you today? And he's like, all I could say was, hi. 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 Because it's, it's like, it's Leonard Nimoy. And then right after that, he gave his speech about how it's he's worn these ears for 30 years. And it's been 30 years since he's worn them. Mm, I remember that. Crying. It's like, how do you, how do you react to something like that? You just smile. Yeah. <laughs> you smile. But the the relationships the people you get to meet being a part of that world you know you you are now a part of star trek history you're part of the canon you have brought this to families all over the world where they are doing what we did when we were kids they're watching tv together as mm -hmm. a family unit as quality time and you yeah. have provided that for them. You've given them these memories that they're going to remember when they're our age and it gets rebooted or a new series gets put out. They're like, Oh, remember when we watched that, when we watched the third season of Picard. Oh, it was so good. How we cried. That is a magical thing. And I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous of myself now by you pointing it out that way. You, you don't think about it, and nor can you or should you when you're doing it, because then maybe it, it would color your approach to it. You just got to do it with sincerity. I think you kind of did think about it because you, you, you said yourself, you know, you were a fan of Trek. You mm -hmm. know, either mm -hmm. casual, heavy, whatever. You were a fan of it, and you knew what what you were doing like when you were talking about wharf 
really not much you need to do, but maybe age him a little bit more, make him a little bit more, you know, refined, a little more spiritual. Um, but you knew the weight that Worf carried. And the fact that you can see that in everything in Kirk's makeup as, as Krill mm -hmm. and Sneed, and you can see that the respect for the franchise and the history and the canon was there. So I think you did know that part, but you kind of went in with, with a lot of humility thinking you're taking care of some, someone else's baby, but yeah. now it's become yours as well. Yeah. You got to be conscious mm -hmm. of the task. Um, someone once asked, you know, what's it like when you create something that becomes iconic and usually that's because it's coupled to a franchise. So Star Trek, obviously. Yeah. Saru is now an iconic design, iconic character. I can guarantee you, although I knew the responsibility of doing a good character, mm -hmm. I didn't go in thinking, wow, I, Neville Page, I'm about to create cinema history. Prepare yourselves, world, for my vision. It certainly <laughs> is, it is not that at all. Um, partially because, again, you're just doing it quick. And you're like frazzled by schedule, the cost, whatever it is. You're not thinking about, wow, how am I going to impact the world? And then you, I, I guess my humility sometimes gets in the way of um, enjoying what you just described. But I can stop and go, wow, I'm watching kids play with that toy. I'm watching people who now see this as a, it's personal mm -hmm. and that working on any film, TV show, piece of entertainment is a privilege because there's so many of us that would like to do it. I mean, I was one of those people that dreamed of doing it. I'm fortunate to be doing it. So it is a privilege to just be associated in this industry in a lot of ways as, as faulted as it can be at times. Uh, but the, yeah. you should never, I, I think be fully aware of that responsibility going into it because it can be overwhelming. I did feel it on Worf um, because I just, I guess it was maybe just a summation of having worked on the franchise for so long. I thought this one's important, Neville. Don't do it right. The thing that's interesting though, and it's a, it's an odd thing to say out loud, not to the public, if you're watching, but the possibility that executives, CBS, JJ Abrams, Terry Metalis might hear me say this. I'm thinking, Ooh, is this what I want to say out loud? But it's important to say it out loud because it's true. And why not live your truth? When I design almost on anything, but especially a beloved franchise, the the design work that I'm putting into it, I've been given the description. I've read the script. I've been told what my job is, what to do. I take all that and go, got it. That will be honored. However, I'm going to pay attention to the audience because they're going to look at it in tremendous, with, with, with very critical eyes. Yes. On pause, in books, in stills in their toys, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And they're going to ask questions about those choices. Whereas you, the boss isn't necessarily, it's an assumption that you can, we're going to do our best job, but they're not telling us oh, what I really need you to do. The camera's never going to see it, but I really need you to pay attention to the bottom of this, the shoe. No one's going to ask you to do that. But when you're designing something, yeah, you know that the, the Star Trek fans in particular are going to look at the bottom of the shoe and have questions about the choices. And it's not a matter of um, having to answer to the fans. That's not how I approach it. It's more a goal of providing thorough, well thought out um, ideas if you're dealing with a square inch of a particular area of a thing, that's the responsibility that I cherish 
and it is a total focus to the fans <clears throat> and has nothing to do with the writer, the director, the producer, or the cinematographer it has nothing to do with them. They're, they're the benefactors mm -hmm. of the fans loving it so much that artists like myself will pay attention to those details. Hope that made sense. It did. And it's that attention to detail that makes it immersive. And that's what Trek fans want. That's what mm -hmm. any fan, but especially sci-fi fans really want. They want this immersive experience. They want to escape reality for a minute. Hell, if I wanted reality, I would pay attention to my kids, but I don't want to do that right Nobody now. Nobody wants that reality. No. <laughs> it's why Star Trek is so successful because we have kids. Yeah. <laughs> Only every once in a while do they show up on this show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, it, the it was the attention to detail was just 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 perfect. Like I was the the bridge on uh, the well Enterprise G, yeah. but it even the wood grain, even the isn't it insane? Grain, it was just absolutely perfect. And the fact that fans these days do this new thing where we pick everything apart, we freeze frame, find an Easter egg, find what you're trying to tell us, you know, like mm -hmm. we've created this whole, really, we've created a whole new genre out of it, the breakdowns and everything on here on YouTube. Um, and so I asked Dave, I was like, the Easter eggs. Was there anything particular, like a reason, like why this? He said, no. <laughs> it's just stuff we liked. <laughs> it was part Excuse of their me. lives and it was it was stuff we liked. Mm -hmm. And so we put it in there. Was there anything in your designs mm -hmm. that, oh, I hope someone sees this. I hope someone catches this. Was there anything that you threw in for funsies for yourself to see if anyone would catch it? <laughs> It's a great question. Um, <clears throat> years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, years ago when I was doing toy design, uh, I thought it would be fun. It was a military World War II type of vehicle. And I thought it'd be fun to, because of the love I have for my nieces, to get their name in there. So government issue, stencil, numerical, thing serial number i did their name in code and i thought he he got it in there <clears throat> and i i felt guilty ever since because it was like ah, why did you do that? that was totally personal that's actually not cool to throw something personal in it's amusing many many years later perhaps mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's kind of not cool in my opinion to to do that it does become amusing years later, but it's it's somebody else's product. And for you to put your personal stuff in there, again, I don't think that's very mature or responsible. No offense to anyone that does it. Do your thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not for me. What I prefer to do in terms of Easter eggs is to do that same idea of plant something, but it's totally connected to the lore the canon yeah. the narrative. Uh, so a better example of that that comes to mind immediately is on the Klingon torchbearer spacesuit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I like this, not out of arrogance, but it's a great example that I share with my students about if you're going to do something, this is a suggestion of what I would um, provoke you to do. There. There's tons of details up and down that that suit, loads of details. So those details were never reviewed by the the team because it just wasn't the time. I'm just forging ahead at a at a breakneck pace trying to get this thing done. So it's not as if I wish, but it wasn't the scenario where we could have meetings and talk about this detail and have several people chime in. It's like, I'm doing a detail. It's three in the morning. Nobody gets to be a part of it because that's just the nature of the beast. Right. And that's where you got to be very careful about the Easter egg thing. It's like, you start putting your niece's name in the Klingon suit. It's like, ah, come on, dude. <laughs> so, 
there's um there's a thigh pad part of this um, costume okay and i'm trying to come up with a detail that satisfies the given goal of it's self-aware art it's it's nuanced it's um it's a torchbearer so it's ceremonial so you can get away with adding a little bit more flourish here and there and there was an opportunity to do like a skull head or something which is a little low-hanging fruit as a motif and i just sat there thinking what else could it be what else could it be and i thought well this suit is all about going out <clears throat> and it, it's the klingons so going out into space into war Today is a good day to die. And I'm thinking of all these things about the Klingons that are in canon. Because um, I did my my research. And I thought, ooh, I think there's an opportunity to manipulate the shape and have it be, because I've already established a Klingon skull um, from a previous prop yeah. piece. So I got my Klingon skull and I'm thinking, okay, that's their death mask. The skull would then make sense to be utilized more often than not, because that's the Klingons, yep. um, they embrace death. And then I thought, the submission into death, how do you represent that visually? Mm -hmm. And I just imagined falling off of something backwards, upside down, falling to your death, arms out. It's that, it's sort of, I didn't want to provoke an antichrist thing, an right. upside down cross, but there was an <laughs> element of that there, not antichrist, just submission, cross-like, upside down, mm -hmm. and using the skull face. And as I was doing it, and this is where you, a life metaphor comes into play, and that is, as you're doing something on the board or in life, can you step back, take a moment? and observe what is happening, not what you are doing, but potentially what is happening to you right. outside of what your intention was. And I saw it with these two arms outstretched and thought, hold on. If I just, it's hard to see here. If I take this arm and go up and uh -huh. take this arm and go down, I saw the Klingon logo. <gasps> and I thought, yeah. let Let's embrace that and let's now create an origin story for the logo. Oh. So when you when you overlay the two, so it became there was an intention of thought. Given a moment to pause and think about it, you you allow stuff to become present to you um, visually, narratively. And that one was fortunate that it just gelled and I thought, oh, this could be something pretty cool. Yeah. Now, wait a minute. I, Neville, am stepping into a franchise deciding to offer up an origin story to the Klingon logo. Touch presumptuous. But hey, um, it's yeah. there if, if you want it to be there. And I, I remember sending it to Alex Kurtzman uh, and a few others who really needed to know about it, saying, got this idea. Are you comfortable with it? moving forward and they they were so then i just kind of made it such that it was a little bit more evident and that then became the origin story to the logo because we didn't we didn't have one if there one there was one that existed i wouldn't uh, touch mm -hmm. it but because it didn't exist to my knowledge i thought this is a really good opportunity that i think fans would appreciate uh yeah and so it was it was risky but again it's all over the suit. Every square inch of that suit has purpose, has Easter eggs, but not personal ones, ones relevant to Klingon lore. The entire thing, if you, I'm looking at my uh, three foot tall version of the suit here in my office, which I can't turn my camera to, but it's, it's riddled with religious, cultural iconography from all over the planet. And that was born out of, is it possible that the Klingons were the first alien visitors on this planet, Earth? And they came with these shapes and motifs and flourishes and, and textures and patterns. And various cultures adopted them. And I'm not saying that the Klingons seeded Earth. 
I'm just saying that it's possible that the Islamic patterning and the Christian forms and the the Naga from um, from various Asian cultures are from the Klingons. So how does that work? How do you reconcile that? Well, you need cool looking stuff. Right. <laughs> this thing needs to look cool. Um, and there's very little way to create stuff that you've never seen before. And at least not have people go, I get the metaphor that looks like, and that's okay. So I wanted to be a bit more purposeful with this and, and then create a story. So when the design was just about complete, I, I said to the various people who really are going to have to deal with this choice of mine, are you comfortable with this ancient alien theory? And it came down to this. Neville, it's there. It's desirable. It's not something we need to advertise because that's not what this moment is about. But if the fans spend some time looking at it, they're going to have questions. And um, someone needs to answer those questions. And if you if your answer to those questions is because you felt it was cool looking, you know, I liked that design, I liked this idea, then it's for the totally wrong reason. But why is there an upside down Christ-like figure all over its legs? What personal message are you trying to send? It's like, no, no, it's the origin of the Klingon logo. Then it's like, oh, that's acceptable. Personal opinion is not. So that, that's where, that's how I approach design kind of for everything is you got to have an answer because most of the design we do doesn't get noticed. If somebody notices it and it's like, well, how did you come up with that design? I say, well, that's my niece's name. It's like, well, you're a jerk. <laughs> this is not about you, is it? And it's not. So you got to be careful when you start finding <laughs> Easter eggs, unless that Easter egg, you know, it's like, well, that's Roddenberry's name backwards. Okay. That's fans will like, but there's my Easter egg answer. Oh, I, that was way better than I could have anticipated. <laughs> like, that was I, I just, I just used chat GPT and I <laughs> had it write that for me. So these were not my ideas. The robot apocalypse is upon us. It's not, this is deep fake. Deep fake. <laughs> right here. Yeah, me too. I opted not to make myself look younger and hotter. I was going for realism. <laughs> oh, me too, always. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, we, you know, because Brian kind of mentors me now. And he says, so it's one of the frustrations about having an artist come from the beauty side of it. We're going for realism. I'm like, okay. I'm just trying to cover stuff, okay? He's like, <laughs> well, yeah, well, I I can't thank you enough for talking with me today. This is certainly. Been, I've had a great time. I have learned a lot. That Easter egg right there, I'm probably going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks, which is going to. I'll send you a. I'll send you a picture afterwards okay. of of kind of the sequence of that because it'll oh. it'll help I think punctuate what the idea was oh my gosh you have okay look <laughs> being the massive klingon dork that i am that's like you you're giving me the origins to the klingon symbol good thing i'm wearing an adult diaper as we <laughs> so yeah, i you have <laughs> when i went out to la it, like this is my only experience with with this stuff is when i went to la Mm -hmm. uh, there were, I say kids, but they're probably in their twenties or thirties. They're Brian's mentees and they're coming in and they're using the space to, to work and everything. And this one young lady is talking about how she's just worked on uh carnival row, eight man lost quantum mania. And I'm just going, what'd you do? Yeah. And she's like, Oh, nothing. Just somebody like, no, that's not nothing. Is it in the movie? Tell me all about it. Like I'm, I'm just, I go so hard. Like I want to hear everything. Tell me everything. Because for me, what you do, that's so exciting. And like, I have loved this stuff my entire life. When I was in the 
but in Shriners growing up, like comic books and sci-fi is how I, I kept grounded, you know, how I kept my, my head straight on, on mm -hmm. the end goal of getting out of there. <clears throat> so to meet someone like you who is brought this stuff to life, like that's, Oh, that's yeah. super exciting for me. It's for you to say, oh, I've got to send you the pictures. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and you're being too generous. I, I'm, I completely recognize that it, what you're saying, because I am <laughs> you in that regard. I, when I go into the makeup trailer or go to Vincent Van Dyke's shop and I see the sculptors doing stuff, people his wife punching hair, Sasha, she's amazing. I'm yeah, so like, what picture. you got, you got to show me how you're doing that. Yeah. I have no reason to know. <clears throat> I have no use, but I love it so much. Um, I, actually I do have use. It's good that I know this stuff, but I am such a fan of this art form. I totally get what you're saying, but I also am not, uh, I don't see myself as, anything other than a fan of this. I'm just privileged to be able to contribute and, and make a living. You know, that that's another hour long conversation with you about, you know, the business side of this, you know, there's, there's a, there's a whole other thing, which is much more pragmatic about it. But trust me when I say, I mean this with all sincerity, I recognize the privileged position I'm in just being able to use my, art. I, I still don't consider myself an artist and that's not being self-deprecating. Um, I see myself as a person with ideas and I have to use forms of art to convey them um, because there are artists, true artists out there doing way better art. Well, they're doing art. I'm not. And that's why I recognize it's a privilege to be able to do what you love and make money to survive. It's crazy. Yeah. that can all go away. You know, there, there are things in life that one must be humble about and know that there's other people that want your job. I don't live in fear in that regard, but you just have to recognize that everything in life is, is temporal and, and fleeting. And you got to love what you can love in this moment and, you know, getting into a kind of a philosophical thing. But I've, I found myself in having these conversations realizing something uh, kind of well, profound for me, and that is the the metaphor, the parallels of life, whether it be relationships that you're having with people, stuff beyond work is identical to what you do with your craft in that if you got something good, you got to feed it and and not expect it to always be there and not take advantage of the fact that it's currently there. So that's the person you're in love with, your child, your pet, whatever it is. Uh, and that is your art. And that is the job that you're on. So if, I know you didn't ask this, but if I could offer one word of advice, um, you know, li live in the now. This is the only moment that is real. Yesterday is bygone and a memory and serves some purpose to the future, but the future is also a hope and a dream and not guaranteed. This is it. This is all that we got. So invest in that, nurture it, whether it be, again, your art, your passion for something, the love for another person, um, and and don't make Hollywood, don't, don't put this stuff too high on a pedestal. Don't put the celebrities, the features, the stuff that you love too high on a pedestal. Cause it's, it's just for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say though, that Picard and the writers, uh, next generation and the writers, they offer dialogue. They offer things that actually are very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, any good writer is going to do that. So yes, although it's entertainment, some, some shows are a little bit more relevant uh, and have much more takeaway in its value. So the my, my point here is that to not lose perspective of what fortunes we have and that 
the only thing that we do know is this very moment. And uh, I would encourage any other artist that aspires to do the privilege that we do is to not, I, I hear this a lot from artists where they're, they're not terribly satisfied with where they're at as an artist, mm -hmm. technically, creatively, or, or um, in their career. Do not judge yourself. Do not compare yourself to others. You, you, the only person you can compare yourself to is, your, is yourself. And the only person you can and should best, better, is yourself. So every day, I don't do this enough, but every day I do ask myself the question at the end of that day, am I better today than I was yesterday? And it, that could be because I've worked on my pencil work. But more importantly, I've worked on my inner work. <clears throat> and if you're conscious of that every day, there's opportunity for personal growth. And there's no comparison to anyone else. There's no Instagram reference point, which is bullshit. We all know that. So just, you know, um, focus on doing better than yourself because you can do better than yourself. And that's an attainable goal. And that's one that we should all strive to be. Do not compare yourself to me. I, I'm going to be a complete hypocrite here and say that I've struggled with that for years, particularly as a young artist. I'm not as good as that person. And there's so many great people to compare yourselves to. It's destructive. It's, it's pointless. So, um, yeah, totally off the uh, script there. But no, that's that. It's phenomenal advice. It's very good advice, and it's advice that I try to give my kids. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do. Hard to practice personally. It really is. But that's why you know every day you ask yourself the question. Um, I would when I went through a divorce. I would force myself to look in the mirror every day and tell myself three things I needed to work on and three things I liked about myself every Fantastic. single day, every single day. And I think that's just a good thing to do period, because we do get wrapped up into that online world. Everyone's persona that they put forward on social media. Well, this person looks like they're doing way better than me. Mm -hmm. you have no idea what's going on when they put the phone down, you have no idea. So the best thing to do is just be the best you, you can. The, the one that you would be proud to say that, yeah, that's me. That's really the best you can do. I remember, I remember a guy, a father of a daughter. Um, I, it's a vague reference, but I'll screw it up initially and fix it. He, <laughs> we're talking about personal growth. Mm -hmm. Are you happy with yourself? And he said something to the effect of, oh, it, he had a daughter and somebody asked him this question. Mm -hmm. Are you the man you would want your daughter to marry? And I don't mean that in a creepy way. I just mean right. that. In, oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And when you look at it that way, because I, I don't have daughters, but I have nieces and I, I clearly have mentioned them enough to showcase that I love them dearly. So I had thought when I was in my, 30s, am I the guy that I, my nieces would be proud of to to date? I know that again, that sounds creepy. I got to frame this a little bit better. No, but, I, I've heard this before. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I better I better look up a better way to quote this. Um, and and then once you have that, it's kind of like the other adage is, if your mother knew this, would she be okay with it? Whatever mm -hmm. it is you're doing, you know, drinking yeah. with your buddies, whatever it is. Would and you be if the answer is no, the story. <laughs> yeah. So if your answer is no, then it's like, okay, then, well, don't be disparaging. Just work on it. Mm -hmm. it it's, 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 um, you know, the cancel culture. I understand what it means, but instead of canceling people, let's give people the opportunity to grow out of and evolve into something better. None of us are perfect. Um, so rather than immediately knee jerk cancel people for, potentially a terrible error growth is key i agree and and, and growth needs to be supported as opposed I, to shame i completely agree and <clears throat> on top of that we live in a, a time a technological age 
where literally anything can be faked at this point, mm. anything. So I kind of come from the, the place of, if I didn't see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it for myself, chances are I'm probably not going to buy into it a hundred percent. I'm going hard, to. My own hard reason. not to, especially when the culture reinforces that you just react, but you know, there's going to be some really unfortunate and unsavory things that happen as a result of people not fact checking, mm -hmm. uh, not not vetting what they've just witnessed, mm -hmm. and only responding to it. And when that happens and it becomes pretty uh, critical mass, I, I don't think until then will the human race have learned the lesson of don't just react. We have a responsibility mm -hmm. to know what we're reacting to. And it's not happening. And it's culturally inbred these days. We should just be having a drink and talking a whole different talk now. You know, <laughs> it's like, we're, hey, we're, Rindo, Brian, we're going over here. We have a, a series on my channel called Unfiltered, where we just kind of sit, have a drink, and we just talk. We'll have yeah. to have you come sometime. Let me let me know. Um, I'd be happy to, to bore people with my opinions. Oh. <laughs> I don't think we would be boring at all. I know. Well, those who are bored would hang up. So we're left with the people who are curious. There right? you go. All Perfect. the important people stick around. <laughs> <laughs> all the like minds. That's all we need. An well, echo chamber. I won't, I won't keep you any longer. I'm just, I'm so tickled that you stuck with me and gave me the opportunity to talk to you and geek out a little bit. It has been an absolute pleasure and joy getting to talk to you and meeting you. Sorry. Likewise. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> but before we go, just make sure you smash the like button. If you're new, please subscribe. Sacrifice that bell to the algorithm gods to let them know you <laughs> want to see more of my stuff coming through. And if you have any questions about, oh, he named it. Brian named our project, and now I can't remember what it is. But it was that's the first question. What is it? It was beautiful <laughs> legs in Spanish, or it was French, and then we went to Spanish. Beljambe, Beljambe, I think it is. But if you have any questions or you would like to be an angel and help invest in the project, go ahead and shoot me a message. I'll put some information down here. You can find me on all the socials. I'm like a disease, I'm everywhere, I'm literally everywhere. But until then, I've been Danny. He has been the awesome Neville Page, and this has been Comics and Cosmetics. Stay nerdy, babies. Bye. <laughs>